Hey, thanks for joining me today. Stories with Sapphire is an independently produced podcast. So if you like what you hear, visit patreon.com slash stories with Sapphire to learn how you can support the show and be a part of it. Hello, believers, non-believers, and everyone in between. You're listening to Stories with Sapphire. I am Sapphire Sandalo. Now get cozy and open your mind because it's story time. Welcome to the first season of my new show, where I'll be sharing the supernatural experiences that shape our world. If after the show you feel compelled to share a story or need paranormal advice, send an email to storieswithsapphire at gmail.com. Chapter 1. Why I Love Supernatural Stories Not many people know this, but I've actually been podcasting since I was nine. Okay, it wasn't podcasting so much as it was me and my sister improvising radio plays on my Talk Girl cassette recorder. There's this rainbow website and we're trying to find out what's on the other side. Of course, it's so obvious that we should go on the other side. But the problem is, how can we get to the other side? Riveting stuff. My point is, this innate desire to tell stories is with us from a very young age, and as we grow older, we develop our own style and learn what stories draw us in the most. And for me, it's supernatural stories. Whether they're true or fiction, scary or strange, uplifting or heartbreaking, the supernatural is part of the human experience all over the world, but especially in the Filipino community. As a second-generation Filipino-American, I grew up listening to the amazing encounters my family had, both in the Philippines and in the U.S. You'll hear from them throughout this series. The one member of my family who had the most stories was my Lolo, or Grandpa. And so one night, when I was about nine, my grandparents were over at our house, so I pulled out my trusty tape recorder and recorded my grandpa telling his stories of when he lived in the Philippines. So it was clear, very clear. The moon is shining. That's right. But then all of a sudden, I hear the sound. It's a piercing, it's a piercing. If the quality were better, I'd play some longer bits for you. But I remember that night very well. My grandpa told us about his encounter with a tikwi, what his region called a mananangal. He told us about his neighbor who dated and later married a fairy. He recounted the giant who would trample his fields at night, the time he saw Sant'Elmo after someone had died in a bar fight. Now, we could pick apart these tales and maybe find rational explanations for what my grandpa witnessed, but that's not the point. The simple act of us gathering around the table, listening to each other intently. That was how we connected. These unbelievable stories are what connect us. Unfortunately, my grandpa no longer remembers these tales, but they are by no means lost. They live on through his family and through me. It's become my mission to preserve and share not only my family's stories, but others as well. So, thanks for connecting with me today. And now... Hope you enjoy our presentation. Chapter 2. The Little People When my grandparents came to America in 1972, the first state they lived in was Hawaii. They had four kids. The youngest at the time was about three years old, my Tito Gabi. One day, the kids were left to play on their own outside. But when it was time to come back in, Tito Gabi was nowhere to be found. They searched everywhere, the nearby forest, underneath the house, nothing. They called out his name, but no response. After almost three hours of searching, Tito Gabi casually walked up to the house as if nothing was wrong. Where were you? We were looking all over for you, exclaimed my grandma. I was playing with the little people, he said. 
In Hawaii, there is a mythical race known as the Menehune. It's said that they lived on the islands far before any settlers came. They are small in stature and only visible to those they choose to be visible to. It's also said that they are incredibly mischievous and love little children. Was my Tito abducted by Menehune? My family believes so. What? Well, everyone except my sister. My grandparents thought that would be the last they heard of the little people, but the Menehune made themselves known again. The house that my grandparents were living in was being worked on. The steps leading to the front door was being filled with new cement. The area was barricaded with tape, and the kids were told not to go near it. One morning, my grandpa walked past the steps and noticed an imprint. He was livid. He went to scold his children, but they all insisted that it wasn't them. Confused, my grandpa took a closer look at the footprint. It was very small, but not small like a child's. The proportions were that of an adult's. And at the tip of the big toe, there was an additional curved imprint, as though whoever's toe this belonged to had a very long nail. because whoever it was realized the cement was wet and left. Why was he going up the door? Good question, sis. Why was it trying to go to the door? My Tito hasn't had any other run-ins with the little people, but what makes this a little more curious is that my Tito is the only one in his family who has pointed ears. Our family likes to joke that the Menehune marked him as their own. Chapter 3, Aswangs and Maria Labo When my grandpa was about 25 years old, the tree outside his home in the Philippines was always swarming with bats. The bats were eating the fruit, so he went out with his gun to see if he can scare them away. He fired one shot, but the bats seemed unfazed. He fired another. Still, nothing. But then, there was a cuss. 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 That's when the bats flew away. My grandpa believes that the sound was coming from an aswang. And like the bats, he got the hell out of there. In the Philippines, an aswang is sort of an umbrella term for shape-shifting demons. They can take the form of a giant black dog or a goat. Some aswangs fly around hunting for human blood. Parents warn their children not to stay out too late, because that is when Aswangs roam. One of the most popular stories about an Aswang is the story of Maria Labo. This is my interpretation of the legend. Decades ago, a woman named Maria lived in Capiz, a province in the Visayan region of the Philippines. She lived there with her husband, Jose, and their two children. Maria had just lost her job, and her husband couldn't support the family on his policeman's salary alone. So Maria made the decision to find work overseas and send money back home. It's a difficult decision to make, one that many Filipinos have made. But Jose assured her that it would be best for the family. We will talk every week, Jose promised. And you won't be gone forever, just until I can get a higher-paying job or until I can find you work again. We can do this. And so, Maria moved to Canada and found a job as a caregiver to an eccentric and very wealthy elderly man named Harry. Maria had been a caregiver to many people before, but this man was definitely interesting. He requested that after sundown, Maria lock his bedroom and not enter until the sun rises the next morning. He handed her a set of keys, one key for each of the six locks on the door. Maria thought his need for privacy was a bit excessive. But what if you need me in the middle of the night? Maria inquired. I won't, he replied confidently. Are you some sort of vampire? 
Maria joked, laughing half-heartedly. The old man smiled. Come now, Maria. Vampires aren't real. After the old man had been locked away, Maria called her family. Because international phone calls were very expensive, Maria limited herself to one conversation with her family per week. She told Jose about the old man's strange request. It worries me, she said. What if something happens to him while he's locked up and I can't get in? Maybe he's just a light sleeper and doesn't like being disturbed, Jose guessed. What do you think the police will do if they see that he died in a room that I sealed? They will arrest me. I don't know if this is a good idea. You'll be fine. He's paying almost three times what others would. We need this, Maria. So Maria carried on. She assisted Harry in the bathroom. She prepared his meals and medication and even played card games with him. And although he was very old and frail, his mind was bright and alert. Harry told Maria stories about his three kids. One was a doctor, another a lawyer, and one a teacher. When he spoke of them, his face lit up, as only a proud father would. How often do you see them? Maria asked. Harry's gaze drifted away. It's been a few years since I last saw them, he replied. They do not visit you? That's terrible, Maria exclaimed, a heaviness forming in her chest. Harry shook his head softly. It's for the best, he said. That night, when Maria called her husband, she told him about what Harry said about not having seen his kids in years. I've only been away from you and the kids for a few months. I can't imagine what not seeing you for years would feel like, Maria explained. You don't know what their relationship is like, Jose answered. Maybe there are things he's not telling you. It was rather curious. Why hadn't his children visited him in so long? Perhaps they had a falling out of some kind? But what kind of fight would lead to abandoning your elderly father forever? Harry seemed like such a kind and gentle man. A little weird, sure, but he was agreeable. She wondered, what if it had something to do with him locking himself up every night? Maria's curiosity was piqued. She had to know. That night, Maria helped Harry into bed like every other night. But when she closed the door, she didn't fully close all the locks. She waited a few hours to make sure that he was asleep before carefully removing the locks one by one. She took a deep breath. She slowly turned the doorknob and gently pushed the door open inch by inch. The light from the hallway seeped into the room, piercing the darkness. The light fell upon the bed. The empty bed. Harry was gone. Maria reflexively turned the bedroom light on. Harry was not in his bed. She began to panic. She felt around the covers under the bed. That's when she heard a soft breath coming from behind her. She carefully turned around. Standing in front of her was a six-foot, slimy-skinned, humanoid creature. It towered over her, its hot breath falling onto her face. Harry? Is that you? Maria trembled. The creature lifted an arm and motioned with its long bony finger for Maria to come closer. Unsure if following its orders was better than not following it, Maria settled on the former. Step by step, she moved closer to the being. It unhinged its jaw and opened wide. Jose was on his way home from a long shift. When he opened the door, he was confused as to why the door was already unlocked. A delicious aroma hit his nose from the kitchen. He followed the smell to find Maria cooking dinner. Maria? You didn't tell me you were coming back. Jose went to embrace his wife. He was surprised by how much bonier she felt in his arms. Sit, 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 dinner's almost ready. Maria gestured toward the table. Jose took a seat and stared at the woman at the stove. Is everything okay, dear? He asked. I'm just tired and hungry from my trip, Maria insisted. 
She pulled a large tray out of the oven and hastily placed it on the table. Let's eat. Kids, it's time for dinner. Jose called out to the back of the house, but there was no response. Maria, where are the kids? Maria was already shoveling food onto her plate. Maria, Jose repeated, where are the kids? Maria raised the bone she was holding and gestured to the tray. They're right here. Jose shot up. Please tell me you're joking. Maria said nothing. Jose pulled out his bolo knife and slashed Maria's face, leaving a long gash from her brow to her cheek. She shrieked in pain. What have you done? Get out of here and never come back, you monster! Maria ran out the door. It is said that Maria still roams the town of Capis at night, so beware of any women with a slash across her face. You might become her next meal. In Filipino folklore, there are many ways one can become an Aswang. In this particular story, Harry was an Aswang and transferred his curse to Maria by opening his mouth and letting the black chick inside him hop out of his stomach and into hers. In passing his power along, Harry also lost his immortality and passed away shortly after. The story of Maria Labo resonates with Filipinos because it's a fear many have. It's common for Filipinos to move to another country to provide for their family. This means not being able to see them for months or years, and in some cases, they never see them ever again. Being away for so long is stressful. You don't know if they're going to return, or if they do, if they'll return as the same person you once knew. What would you do if someone you loved suddenly became a monster? Chapter 4. How to Kill an Aswang I know how to spot an Aswang. My eyes have memorized the signs. Skin stretched tightly over bones, veins drooling blood from sockets. To the untrained eye, they look exactly like us. Like a magic eye painting, they blend into their surroundings, our schools, our stores, our homes. But those who stare long enough know better. I know better. I know how to kill an Oswang. I have many times before. My limbs move to an invisible conductor. Garlic, salt, prayer, whip. Garlic, salt, prayer, whip. My body is no stranger to this dance. No one knows this choreography better than me. I know how to kill an Oswang. When the sun shines above, their secrets are on display and they cannot hide. That is when you strike. Garlic, salt, prayer, whip. I know how to kill an Oswang. When their face conjures no name. When they've never stroked my hair or cradled me until I fell asleep. When my walls are not littered with imprints of their alter ego. Please do not rush me. Okay, I know how to kill an Aswang. I have many times before. But I have no idea how to kill you. Chapter 5. Zack Ford it's not just Filipinos who pass down cautionary tales. Our next story comes from Gavin, a listener in South Carolina whose stepfather told him the tale of Zach Ford that's been passed down in his family. It's got all the makings of a classic urban legend, a curious location, a mysterious figure, and a warning. Don't go out past midnight. This takes place in 1996, in the town of Florence, South Carolina. I headed down from my home in New York to visit my cousin Beth in South Carolina for a few weeks. She was pregnant with her first child and was expected to deliver in any day. 
the father was a dick and there was a 99% chance that he's not going to be a model parent. We were close growing up and she didn't want to be alone. When night fell, I asked her if there was anything to get into for the evening as far as entertainment. She told me that there was a pool hall just up the road called Jake's Place. Just don't stay out too late, Curtis, she warned. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're about ready to drop that load in the oven, so you're worried that... No, 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 it's not that, Curtis. It's just, please trust me on this. Don't stay out too late. Okay, I, I won't, I said with unease. After turning off the street that my cousin lived on, I bared onto another street called Chinaberry Road, where Jake's place was located. That's a weird name for a road, I thought to myself. According to Beth, Jake's place was a hole in the wall that all the locals would gather during the evening hours of the weekdays and weekends, especially the weekends. It was famous for two things, the homemade whiskey called the Big Itch, and for the man that used to drink it, Zach Ford. The sign outside over the entrance read, Welcome to Jake's Place, home of the Big Itch and Zach Ford's last stop. I made myself comfortable at the bar and ordered a drink. I'll have the Big Itch, please, on the rocks, I said. The bartender, Jake, also the owner, gave me my drink and I took a sip. It was amazing stuff. We were making small talk, and he was telling me about how his dad, Jake Sr., opened the place a while back. When we heard a man cry out in a barrage of incoherent belligerence across the room, he was obviously plastered. Hey, pipe down, Earl. You keep it up and I'm going to run your ass out of here, Jake shouted. The town drunk? I asked. Earl Simmons is the poster child for the term town drunk. That guy is almost as bad as Zach Ford, said Jake, shaking his head. So, who is Zach Ford anyway? A local legend? I pegged. Jake looked up at me with a blank stare. No. Something else, he said. What the hell does that mean? I thought to myself. I got up from the bar and went for a few rounds of pool. In between games, I helped myself to a few more rounds of the Big Itch whiskey. I was feeling pretty buzzed after my fifth drink. When my losing streak at the pool table began to rise, I knew I had enough, and it was time for me to go. As I went to the bar to pay my tab, there was a crash across the room. Earl had reached the point where he started knocking things over and damaging things that he couldn't afford, clearly drunk off his ass. Jake came from behind the bar and ushered him out of his establishment and told him he was done for the night. Before I left, I bought a bottle of the Big Itch whiskey to go. When I got back into my car, I had noticed that I never took my phone out. It must have fell out of my pocket onto the seat as I was getting out earlier. I picked it up and noticed that Beth had called me like 10 times within the past hour. I immediately panicked. How could I have been so stupid? Beth's water must have broken and she was trying to contact me. I was already backing out of the parking lot, turning back onto Chinaberry Road and accelerating as I called her back. I passed Earl, who had his thumb out, trying to catch a ride. When I didn't stop, his thumb turned into a middle finger. Still holding the phone to my ear, it finally stopped ringing and Beth's voice came over the phone. Oh my God, Beth, I'm so sorry. I left my phone in the car. I'm on my way right now. Okay, No, Curtis, I'm not in labor. That's not why I was calling you. Listen, are, are you still at Jake's place? No, I just left. I'm coming down Chinaberry Road right now. Oh God, oh God. Curtis, listen to me. You need to turn around and go the other way. Do not stay on Chinaberry Road. Just turn around right now and... A deer had suddenly leapt out in front of me. I frantically swerved around the deer, lunging my car on the opposite side of the road, bringing it to a stop next to the guardrail. I threw the gear in park. Then suddenly, the engine and the lights in my car completely died. My car had just passed inspection. There was absolutely no reason for it to malfunction. There I was in the blackened night, dimly lit by the half moon above me. I bent over in the passenger side, trying to feel for my phone, when abruptly, a slow tapping noise came from my driver's side window. Hey buddy, you got a big itch? I know you've been drinking, and I want some drawled a low, melodious baritone voice. 
my skin became raked with a frosty fear. I slowly turned my head to the window to find a tall man standing there, too tall to see his face. He wore a nasty, dirty-looking, buttoned-up shirt with worn suspenders around it that was holding up rag-like pants. I want that big itch, buddy, you hear? I ain't gonna ask you again, the man warned. I was frozen stiff. I had to will myself to move. I couldn't believe that I was being mugged. Luckily, only for my liquor, which no clue how he knew I had it. Maybe he'd been watching me at the bar and followed me. I quickly fumbled around for the bottle. Thank God it was right next to me in the passenger seat. I opened my door and lifted the bottle in the air. Please don't hurt me, I begged. Without a response, the bottle was snatched from my hand. By now, I had my eyes closed, crying and shaking uncontrollably. Then suddenly, the white noise from my car radio pierced my ear. I opened my eyes to find that my car had come back to life. I turned my key in the ignition and the engine followed suit. I turned back onto the right side of the road and made my way back to my cousin's house. The next morning, we were eating breakfast when the news came on with a tragic story. A local man was found mysteriously decapitated at the bridge on Chinaberry Road last night. Authorities have not made a definite identification yet, but they believe the man to be Earl Simmons of Florence. Witnesses say that Earl was spotted leaving the local bar after being kicked out by the owner for vandalism. While not entirely certain, it is however believed that the man was killed to further empower the local legend of Zack Ford. Authorities have yet to find the victim's head. Me and Beth slowly turned from the TV and looked at each other. She started crying. They'll never find his head. This is why I was so worried last night, she said. Wait, why won't they ever find his head? I asked, my voice quivering. And that's when she told me the story. Between the late 70s and early 80s, Jake's dad opened the pool hall on China Berry Road. During that time, Zach Ford was the town's drunk. He was a regular at Jake's place, and his favorite drink was the Big Itch. He got so drunk one night, he walked all the way down Chinaberry Road and up to the railroad crossing, where he passed out with his head laying on the track. A regular scheduled locomotive came through and took his head clear off. Rumors started to circulate about people claiming to see Zach Ford walking down Chinaberry Road, trying to make his way back to Jake's place. But people also say that if you come across him at night and he asks you for a drink and you don't have it, he'll pull your head clean off your shoulders. I looked at her for a few minutes, dumbfounded. Then I told her what happened to me the night before. A week later, my cousin gave birth to a vibrant and healthy baby boy. On my way back to New York, I stopped by Jake's place early that afternoon to buy another bottle of Big Itch whiskey. Getting back on Chinaberry Road to head for the interstate, I noticed a wooden plaque mounted just off the side of the road in front of the guardrail. I didn't notice it that night for obvious reasons. I pulled over to see what it said. As I read it, I became embodied with the same fear that had consumed me on that night. Got a big itch? Better hope you do, after dark on Chinaberry Road, or old Zach Ford with his headless self instead just may take your soul. You see a train took his head when he was all liquored up, and he's still out looking for a drink. So when he comes asking, best not be lacking, lest he'll be headless in a blink. So if you've been drinking, coming down Chinaberry, old Zach Ford will know. And if you don't have a drink, well, of course he'll leave, but not without your head in tow. Now it's time to respond to your messages. Any advice that I offer is purely my opinion and meant for entertainment purposes. Hi, Sapphire. Ever since I heard that story from one of the Something Scary podcast episodes, I feel like I have a spiritual attachment. 
The episode was about the Hmong burial ritual with the drum playing. I listened to that episode at home while cooking. That same night, I woke up at 2 a.m., which is not unusual, to get a drink of water. When I walked into the kitchen, I had an uneasy feeling as if I was being watched. We've lived in the same house for over 10 years, and I've never felt that way before. A few days after, the security alarm kept going off in the middle of the night. It was weird because I would wake up first, then a few seconds later, the alarm panel will say, kitchen side window, and the alarm will ring. It happened at 1 a.m., then again at 3 a.m. After shutting off the alarm, I went back to bed when I heard two knocks on our bedroom window, which is right above our bed. The knocking sound was loud, as if it was from inside my room, not outside. We have a raised foundation, so the window cannot be reached by anyone standing outside. I eventually fell asleep, but when I woke up, I heard scratching coming from between the walls in my bedroom. Other bizarre things have happened to me, such as chairs will rotate to face me, but no one is sitting on it, and static calls on my cell. But recently, I woke up in the middle of the night to find a girl with long, black, messy hair staring at me. Her hair was scattered in front of her face, but I can feel her staring. I couldn't do anything but look back until her image disappeared. A few nights after, I felt someone punch my big toe to wake me up, and no one was there. I was wondering if there is something I can do to remove this attachment. I strongly feel that the Something Scary story attracted this spirit, so maybe there is also a Hmong ritual of some sort to remove it. Thank you for your time, Alfie. Well, thank you for sending that in, Alfie. Well, first of all, for those of you who may not know, the podcast that I created before this one was called Something Scary, and the episode that Alfie is referring to, it takes place at a Hmong burial, and there is a type of instrument that is only played at these events. And at the time, I actually did not know that you are not supposed to play that music outside of a burial or funeral. Um, I believe it's because... The instrument and the type of music, it is opening the gateway into the other realm. So if you're playing it, you know, when nobody is traveling back and forth, then spirits might enter our world or we might enter theirs. I believe that's what it was. But either way, um, you know, you're not supposed to listen to that. And there was a listener who emailed me after that episode went up and they were the ones who actually told me that and I was like oh no now I feel really bad that I put this music in the episode I did alter the music a little bit so I'm kind of hoping that that was enough to you know not make the music as close to it is when you play it at a funeral so Alfie I think um, because personally I don't think simply listening to a story can cause a spirit attachment um, if there was something in your home it probably was already there and you didn't know to me I feel like listening to the story might have heightened your awareness of its existence so I would also recommend that you take a look at what your current emotional state is like are you you know particularly stressed right now are you not getting enough sleep these also play a factor in hauntings because malicious spirits are drawn to those who are filled with negative energy but if you're concerned that this spirit could potentially cause you more harm in the future um, here is something that you can try very simple sometimes all it takes for a spirit to leave you alone is for you to vocalize it So in a firm voice, tell the spirit that they are not welcome, that this is your home, not theirs. Most of the time, these spirits interfere with our lives because we allow them to. So don't let them. These rules also apply with the living. You know, you can't expect somebody to know how you feel until you actually communicate that. So this spirit that is bothering you, they're not going to leave until you tell them to leave. But um, if you try this and the activity still continues, I suggest finding a healer or a priest, depending on what religion you practice, if any, and have your home cleared. So keep us posted, Alfie, and I wish you the best. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to show your support. 
Special shout out to my grandpa. What stories are passed down in your family? Let me know at storieswithsapphire at gmail.com. Salamat and good night. Stories with Sapphire is created and produced by me, Sapphire Sandalo. Zach Ford was written by Gavin Godbolt. All other stories and music written by Sapphire Sandalo. For more information on this episode, visit storieswithsapphire.com.